Let's start chapter 7, Momentum. Okay? Now, the momentum is linear momentum, by definition, is mass times velocity. Now, we know about mass. We know about velocity, right? In previous chapters somewhere, we learned something about mass times acceleration. And we knew that at mass times acceleration was a force. But we never multiplied mass times velocity before. This is the first time we're doing this. Now, we know mass is a scalar quantity because the kilogram itself does not have any physical direction. Right? Velocity, however, does have direction because it is a vector. Okay, So mass, which is scalar, times velocity, which is a vector, will give you a vector, okay? So momentum, momentum is a vector, okay? Momentum is a vector, okay? Therefore, right, momentum must have direction. must have direction. It has to be a physical direction, right? So momentum, right, must have, right, like x hat, y hat, z hat, okay? Or momentum can also be represented as the magnitude of the momentum and the angle theta, which is the direction part, okay? Now, someone may ask, well, how did momentum get represented as lowercase p? How does p and momentum get, you know, tied together? Well, there's no real, like, true answer for that, except there's some, like, myth that's floating around saying that, well, when Newton was trying to explain this momentum, John, he ran out of like letters. Like M was taken by mass, and then it was also taken by the unit, you know, of meters. So you couldn't really use M as a variable anymore. So he decided to represent momentum as the object's persistence of motion, right? So when object had momentum, it had persistence. So that persistence, P, is how he decided to call momentum, all right? So when there's change in momentum, right? So if there's momentum where mass times velocity, there could be some change in velocity. And if there's change in velocity, the momentum definitely could be changed, right? Now, again, when you change velocity, you don't have to change just numerical value of velocity. You could change velocity by changing just the direction as well, right? So velocity can be changed two ways. One, by changing the speed. Another way will be changing the direction of that velocity, okay? Well, when that changes, then there's definitely change in momentum as well, okay? So when velocity changes, right? Then momentum changes. Okay, oops. Momentum. Momentum. Right? So, therefore, therefore, change in momentum can be represented as, right, um, final momentum minus the initial momentum, okay? 
Well, we know momentum is mv. So this can be represented as mass times final velocity minus mass times the initial velocity. Or simply put, change in momentum, if mass stays constant, can be represented as change in velocity times mass. So by looking at this, which is basically that, right? Which is that, this right here. So we can say change in momentum is equal to m times change in v. If we were to divide both sides of this, change in momentum and m change in velocity by delta t, look what happens. to this. This becomes acceleration. So this becomes MA, which we know it as the net force. So this, which is equal to the net force, can also be represented as my change in momentum over delta T. Okay. So Newton described his second law of motion two ways. One way would be this, which is F equals MA, right? And another way would be the net force is equal to the time rate of change in momentum. Okay? Time rate of change in momentum. Okay? So how is that helpful? Well, <clears throat> what happens when this net force doesn't exist? This has to be net external force, okay? That's more important, okay? So sum of all F external force must equal to change in momentum divided by change in time. So what happens when this external net force is zero? What must equal to zero? When net external force is equal to zero, what has to be zero on this side of the equation? Right? So if net external force is equal to zero, then what has to be zero to make this equation work? If this is zero, what has to change in momentum must go to zero. Very good. That's non-negotiable. Then change in momentum must equal to zero. Okay? That means because my net external force is equal to zero, right, change in momentum must also equal to zero. Therefore, momentum final minus the momentum initial must equal to zero. So if I bring this negative initial momentum to the other side, it becomes positive. Therefore, total initial momentum must equal to the total final momentum when net external force is equal to zero. So if and only if, so this is true, if and only if the net external force is equal to zero. So what does that mean? Well, 
Lulu, have you ever tried to push a car from inside? No. No? You, ever, you should try it. Yeah. Let's say, like, you know, your car stopped and you want to move your car, but it's raining outside. And you're like, okay, guys, listen, you know, it's raining out right now, so I'm going to push this car from inside and I'm going to push the dashboard, okay? Is it going to move? No. No, of course not. Because ex internal force cannot change momentum, right? Because if you push your car from inside, you're just going to eh, strain yourself, but nothing's going to move. Only the external force, only the push from outside of the car will make change in momentum. Does that make sense? But if there's no push from the outside, when there's no external force, the momentum cannot be changed. Is that okay? It's like when you're in a sailboat, you know? You like blow on the sail while you're sitting in the sailboat. Would that work? No, it will not work, right? So, so internal forces cannot change momentum whatsoever. Okay, so that's good to know. So this means, right, a system cannot change its momentum by itself. It could only change momentum if there's some kind of external force acting on it, right? So unless, this is very important, unless a system is acted upon by some net external force, right? The initial momentum of a system must equal to the final momentum of the system. And that's what this says. So all this pretty much says that. However, two or more systems may exchange momentum because they have to add up the same amount, but they could change exchange momentums. But the total momentum, when you add them up, cannot be different when you compare it to the initial and final. Okay? So we're going to talk about that more in detail. So, let's see how that works. Let's say we have a garden hose, and then we like, we're washing our car, right? Water is getting nice and all, so you're going to wash your car. And you, you spray water on side of a car, right? So you, you get yourself a hose, right? You get yourself a hose, like a fireman, fireman's hose, I guess, right? And you turn the water on, right? And the water is going to come out. Right? And of course, the water is going to hit the side of your car. And since we live on main line, you know, it's, it's going to hit like, you know, side of the Porsche, right? Cayenne. At least, at least Range Rover, right? I mean, come on, it's the main line, right? So it's going to hit the side of a car and it's going to stop. So initially, Initially, what happens? Well, we have this water coming out with speed of 20 meters per second. And that's the initial speed. The speed of water afterwards, after it hits the car, you know, so velocity of water final is equal to zero. They tell us the water, amount of water coming out of this is ridiculous. It's like 1.5 kilograms every second, right? So the rate of water coming out, which is equal to mass divided by delta T, right, is equal to 1.5 kilograms per second.
let's see how we can utilize what's given to us here to figure out how much force is acting on the side of your mainline vehicle. Okay? So what is the force exerted by the water on the car? Okay? So here we go. Ready? Ready? If the net force here is equal to, we said it was change in momentum, right? Divide by change in time. We know that change in momentum is basically momentum final minus the momentum initial divided by change in time. Well, the momentum final is really nothing more than mv final minus mv initial divided by change in time. If I factor out the mass from both terms at the top, I get m times vf minus vi. Divide that by delta t. This looks like my r. Okay, that looks like my r. The rate of mass coming out of the nozzle of your hose. So now we could say r times vf minus vi. That's my net external force. Therefore, R, which happens to be 1.5 kilograms per second, times V final is zero, minus V initial, which is equal to uh, 20 meters per second. This gives me negative. 30 kilograms times meters per second squared, which is same as negative 30 newtons. So that's how much right, the water exerts on the car. It's negative only directional, right? This doesn't mean it's, it just doesn't mean like, you know, it's just directional. So the, the net force is 30 newtons as far as the amount of force is concerned. Okay. Now obviously if I were to switch the direction and, and did it this way, and shot it this way, it came out positive. Right. All right, any questions so far? All right, good, good. All right. Has anyone shot a gun before in this class? That's good. Right? What do you feel when you shoot a gun? Besides the exhilaration of having that power that you're wielding, right? Yeah, you get pushed back. Very good. That's called recoil, right? And bigger the gun, bigger the recoil usually, right? If you ever shoot 22s, it's like, right? It's like just like you know, shooting nothing. But if you ever shoot like 357 Magnum, you're gonna feel it. You know, or if you shoot like 50 caliber Desert Eagle, you got to really be careful or it's going to break your wrist, right? So the recoil happens because of conservation of momentum, okay? So let's see how that conservation of momentum works out for the recoil. So let's say we have a bullet whose mass M is 50 grams. It's fired horizontally with speed of V of 420 meters per second. 
So we have to really convert this mass of the bullet into kilograms to keep it consistent. So the mass of bullet is equal to 0 0.050 kilograms. The speed of the bullet, 420 meters per second, is about like 1.3 times the speed of sound, which sounds about right. And the mass of the rifle is 6 kilograms. Okay? So we have bullet inside the rifle. I made the bullet a lot bigger so that you could see. Right? So this is the bullet right here. And the mass of the rifle is 6 kilograms. So we have our initial and final conditions. Our initial condition is right here, right, where we have mass of the bullet is equal to 0 0.050 kilograms, right? And we have initial velocity of the bullet is 0 meters per second, because it wasn't fired yet. The mass of the rifle happens to be 6 kilograms, and velocity of the rifle initial is zero meters per second because it wasn't moving. So these are all our initial conditions. Right? Well, the final condition, for the final condition, we know the mass of the bullet stays the same. The mass of the bullet is 0 0.050 kilograms. Velocity of the bullet final happens to be positive 420 meters per second. Then the mass of the rifle is 6.0 kilograms. And velocity of the rifle final is what we're trying to calculate. So this is the final condition. So we could start with sum of all momentum initial must equal to sum of all momentum final. Initially, you know, I have momentum bullet initial plus momentum rifle initial is equal to momentum bullet final plus momentum of rifle final. Here, M bullet V bullet initial plus M rifle V rifle initial is equal to M bullet V bullet final plus M rifle V rifle final. We already said this and this are these are zeros. That was easy. So this whole left side is zero. However, here, my mass of the bullet is 0 0.050 times the velocity of the bullet final is 420 plus mass of the rifle, which is 6.0, times the velocity of the rifle final, which we don't know. Okay? We don't know it. So here, 0 is equal to this times that is 21 plus 6.0 V rifle final. So my velocity of my rifle is equal to negative 21 is equal to 6.0 right, V rifle final. So my V rifle final will have 
recoil velocity of negative 21 divided by 6 is negative 3.5 meters per second. <clears throat> So, now what? Well, let's say the bullet's fired already, and it's traveling, and now this bullet is traveling at 420 meters per second, and then gets, it hits a wooden target with a block, with a mass of six kilogram block, and the bullet penetrates into the block and gets embedded in it. So now the bullet and the block of wood will travel together as one on a, in a, on a frictionless surface. Okay. How fast will the bullet and the block be traveling after they collide? So this looks like an initial condition right here, and this looks like the final condition. We're looking for this VF So again, we could start with sum of all momentum initial is equal to sum of all momentum final Initially, I would have momentum initial of the bullet plus the momentum initial of the block is equal to I have momentum of the bullet plus the block final because they become one together I'll just make it as one momentum okay therefore M bullet times V bullet initial plus mass of the block times the velocity of the block initial right, must equal to mass of the bullet plus the mass of the block times V final. So let's plug in some numbers. Let's plug in some numbers. Here, mass of the bullet, 0 0.050 times the velocity of the bullet, 420, right? plus the block initially had zero velocity. So this whole thing goes to zero. Plus, well, is equal to 0 0.050 plus 6.0 times VF. I could have made different, you know, mass for the block. I could have made it 12 just to make it a little different than the same mass as the rifle. But you'll be able to see the same concept. So here, if I multiply these two, I get 21 again, is equal to, this here is 6.050 VF. So my VF is equal to, notice, it is positive, positive, 3.47 meters per second. I guess if you want to be precise, you could put X hat down. But since they want just the speed, you could say VF is equal to 3.47 meters per second. The velocity is positive 3.47 meters per second x hat, but the speed is just magnitude of that, which is positive.
Okay. Another very similar thing would be railroad carts. Have you ever seen railroad carts crash? Oh my God, it's so violent. I love it. And it makes a huge sound too. And when they actually couple together, you know, they move together as one. So if we take a look at conservation of momentum collide and stick together again, we have 10,000 railroad, 10,000 kilogram railroad car traveling at 24 meters per second. Right? So here is a railroad car right? traveling So V, so M1 is equal to 10,000 kilograms. And V1 initial is equal to 24 meters per second. Well, we have second railroad car, which happens to be identical. That means this car's mass, which is M2, should also be 10,000 kilograms, but it is at rest, which means my V2 initial is zero meters per second. So I guess if you want to, you can make this X hat just to make it more precise. So this is my initial condition. Then my final condition is this 10,000 kilogram railroad car gets stuck with the first one. And they move together as one, right? So now they're traveling as right, one. I want to know what the V F is. A VF of one plus two. Right? So this would be my final condition. So again, if you want to say, okay, let me say this word. So sum of all momentum initial must equal to sum of all momentum final. Initially, I could have momentum one initial, momentum two initial. Here, I have momentum of one plus two final. Therefore, here, M1 V1 initial plus M2 V2 initial is equal to M1 plus M2 times V1 plus 2 final. Therefore, M1, 10,000 times V1 initial is 24 plus V2 initial is zero. So this whole term just goes to zero is equal to, I have 10,000 plus 10,000 V1 plus two final is what we have. 
So this is 240,000 is equal to 20,000 V1 plus 2 final. So my V1 plus 2 final is equal to positive right, 12 meters per second exit. So that wasn't that bad. Any questions? Okay. All right. All right, then. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at the next problem. All right, here's another conservation of momentum problem. Internal motion problem. Now, if there's any kind of internal force, we should not be able to change its momentum, correct? Therefore, when we add up the momentum, it should be exactly the same as the initial momentum when there's only internal forces happening. So if I started out with zero momentum initially, no matter what happens inside the thing, I should always add up to zero. Right? Well, in this particular problem, a man with a mass of 70 kilograms is standing on the front end of a flat railroad car, right? which has mass of 1,000 kilograms and a length of 10 meters. So this railroad car is 10 meters long. It's standing still, and the man is standing at the one end, front end, okay? And the man then walks from one end of the car to the other end at speed of one meter per second relative to the track. So if I were to watch this person right, from outside, right, he's walking one meter per second. Assume there's no friction on the wheel of the railroad car. Right? What happens to the cart while man is walking? What do you think is going to happen when he starts to walk? Now, I had a student who actually tested this was this student was a doubting Thomas. Right? Anybody know the term doubting Thomas? Yeah. Thomas was a disciple of Jesus. And when people said, you know, Jesus is alive, Thomas said, I doubt it. And he only will believe when he stick the finger through the hole where the nail went through. And that's what a doubting Thomas stands for. Anyway, one of my students was a doubting Thomas and didn't believe me that cart's gonna walk the other way. So he ran to actually Home Depot. He got a flat cart and brought it inside a nice level place and he walked on that thing to see if it actually worked. And he videotaped it and he brought it into class and it worked. I, I actually gave him extra credit. I thought that was pretty cool. Right. People at Home Depot thought he was crazy. He got chased out, <laughs> you know. But he told me the whole story. It was really funny. So I swear we're doing this for physics, man. You know, I got to get out of here, kids. Yeah. But yeah, he got his, you know. Anyway, let's think about what happens. Initially, the man is at rest and the cart's at rest. The total momentum initially is what? Good, like you said, nothing, zero, right? Absolutely correct. So initially, momentum, total momentum is zero. It has to be zero. However, when he starts to move, he has momentum. That means in order to compensate for his momentum, the cart has to also 
move too in the opposite direction. So when you add both of those momentums up, they're better equal to zero, right? So that's what we have to think about. So for part A, for part A, sum of all momentum initial must equal to sum of all momentum final. We know the momentum for the cart initial plus momentum for the man initial must equal to momentum for the cart final plus the momentum for the man final. Initially, the cart's at rest. Mass of the cart times velocity of the cart initial plus mass of the man plus times the velocity of the man initial is equal to mass of the cart times the velocity of the cart final plus mass of the man times the velocity of the man final. So we want to know what happens when man starts to walk. So here we know initial moment, initial is fine, uh, zero and for the man and the cart. So the total momentum initial is zero. However, man, which has man's mass of 70 kilograms times the velocity of the man. I'm sorry, I, I switched this around. Velocity of the man final is negative 1.0 meters per second x hat plus mass of the cart which is 1000 kilograms times the velocity of the cart final which we don't know so when I multiply this I get 70 negative 70 kilograms meters per second plus 1000 V cart final So if I bring this negative 70 to the other side, it becomes positive, right? So 70 kilograms meters per second is equal to 1,000 kilograms times Vc final. So notice what happens to the kilograms. It gets canceled out, and my Vc final comes out to be 70 divided by 1,000 right? meters per second. So what do I get? My VC final then becomes positive, right? positive, 0 0.07 meters per second excess. That means when man walks in the negative direction at one meter per second, as long as he's walking that way at one meter per second, the cart has to compensate for that in order to get the total momentum to be, to be zero. It moves in the positive x direction at 0.07 meters per second. Okay? Now let's answer C next. What happens when the man stops at the rear of the car? What happens? What has to happen? Car has to stop. Yeah, there's, there's no negotiation because it has to conserve momentum, right? So if a man stops, car has to stop, right? So I know, I know like a popular wrong answer that could be going against your intuition would be, wait a minute, wasn't the car in motion? So shouldn't it be staying in motion because of inertia? But shouldn't the man should be motion too then, right? So, but if man stops, the car has to stop because it has to conserve momentum first. Okay. So, so for part C, let's do, let's do part C first. When the man stops. No matter where he stops, whether he stops in the halfway or at the other end or three quarters of the way, it doesn't matter. When he stops, the car has to stop. Okay? 
the court must right, stop in order to right, conserve momentum. There's no negotiation on that. When man stops, card stops. Now, what about part B? Okay, what about part B? How long does it take him to reach the other end of the card? Now, you have to be really careful about this. When he's walking on a flat earth, let's say, he's walking at 10 meter, uh, 1 meter per second. If he walks 1 meter per second for 10 meters, how many seconds will he take? Louder? 10, 10 seconds. That makes sense, right? If he's walking 10 meters, one meter per second, it should take 10 seconds, right? Did you ever go to an airport and walk on one of those, like, moving sidewalks? Oh, I love them, you know? It makes you feel like a superman, right? You're just walking normal on that moving sidewalk, and people just, like, you're just blowing by people, like, you know? Now I understand how Hussein Bolt feels like, you know? Like, you know? Or you could just stand still, right, and just move with the speed of the moving sidewalk. Make sure you put your, like, you know, carry-on luggage on the side so nobody can pass you. Just to be different, right? Or you can be really different and walk the other way, <laughs> right? When the other people are coming, and you just walk the other way, the opposite direction. You ever do that? Oh, it's great. People look at you funny. Very angry, too. But for physics, it's worth it. But one of my point is, let's say somebody's like way over there on the other end, and that person's coming at you on the moving sidewalk, and you're walking in the opposite direction towards that person. Would you get to that person faster than person who's not on the sidewalk walking? Who's going to get there first to the kid? Let's say, for example, let's say I have a, I have a, a kid observing this man, right? Like, on the, on the train, he's observing this man walking towards him. And he's saying, dude, you're walking the wrong way, man, you know? Right? So as he's walking this way, the cart's moving towards him. So this kid is actually moving towards the man as the man is walking towards the kid. Does that make sense? So will this man take 10 seconds to walk to the kid? No. Would it be less than 10 seconds or more than 10 seconds? Yeah, because the kids are actually moving towards the man as man, as, uh, as man is walking towards the kid, right? right? So it should take less than 10 seconds. Very good. That logic works, right? So how fast is that man walking relative to the kid? Let's say this kid has a radar detector and fires a radar detector to this man. How fast is he going to be reading? Now remember, the kid is actually moving towards him at 0.07 meters per second, and the man is walking towards the radar detector at 1 meter per second. Do you see what, do you see what I mean? The kid is moving towards the man. So the radar detector is moving towards the guy at 0.07 meters per second. And the man is moving towards the radar detector at 1 meter per second. So 
So what should the radar detector record? One point zero seven meters per second. That's correct, right? So the speed relative to the kid, right, is going to be with respect to kid will be one point oh seven meters per second. But the distance he travels is still going to be ten meters because that railroad car doesn't shrink. It's going to stay 10 meters, but he's going to be walking at 1.07 meters per second now instead of one meter per second. I'm looking for time. So we know, right, V is equal to distance divided by time. Therefore, time is equal to distance divided by V. So 10 meters divided by 1.07 meters per second gives me 9.35 seconds. So it definitely takes less than 10 seconds. That's pretty mind blowing, isn't it? Yeah. I can't twist your mind more than drugs. Yeah, yeah. Physics can twist your brain more than any drugs. You can see. Just don't get hooked on that stuff. You know, you end up like me. You know, peddling physics to young kids. No good if you get hooked to the physics. All right. Anyway, so let's see if we can actually do this problem here. Let's see if you can do these two problems, and then we'll go over them today. And then I'm going to give you some time to work some of these problems in class. I, th I think you guys really earned yourself some really nice break because spring break's coming and all, you know. And, and, and we can work some of these problems in class together rather than giving you, like, homework. Is that okay? Right. But for now, let's see if we can work on these two problems, and then... Um, We'll come back and then go over these two problems, and then we'll finish up for today. So I'm going to give the other people at home a breakout session. I'm going to pause the recording here. Ship zooming through the sky. Boring. Get on board. We're ready to explore. There's so much to find. Ugh. You guys didn't grow up with a little Einstein? Anyway. So here's my rocket, right? You guys, you guys are boring. You guys are just like the pure virtual world. It's very quiet. All right. So if you were to think about it, this right here gives me the burn rate, so which is the rate of how much mass per unit of time our mass is being spent right here, which happens to be 1,300 kilograms per second. And we know sum of all forces equal to, right, the change in momentum over change in time, and we derived that mass times delta V over delta T is how we got to this. Take a look at the, right, the water hose problem. This right here is the rate times delta V. That's my net force. So my net force is equal to 1,300 times uh, 40,000 minus zero. So my net force comes out to, uh, what is that? 1,300, oops, times 40,000. And I get 
5.2 times 10 to the 3 and 7 newtons, 52 million newtons of force acted on by my engine. All right. Thanks for stopping by. Have a nice day. Uh, I'll see you guys on Thursday. All right. Take care, everybody. Bye.